as true crime enthusiasts know, often serial offenders carry a moniker or nickname. Who could forget such terrifying titles like the Night Stalker and the Green River Killer? There was the Hillside Strangler and the Servant Girl Annihilator. These names were bestowed upon these killers by the press and even the law enforcement agencies that investigated their crimes. In some cases, the killer simply cannot wait long enough for the press or law enforcement to come up with a clever or even not so clever name. So some killers provide the press and law enforcement with a name to call them until they are discovered, outed, and pulled into the light from the dark shadows where they hide. Jack the Ripper penned letters to the police, authentic or otherwise, giving himself what he called the trade name when he signed the famous Dear Boss letter, Yours truly, Jack the Ripper. David Berkowitz wrote to NYPD Captain Joseph Borelli, telling him, I am deeply hurt by you calling me a woman hater. I am not, but I am a monster. I am the son of Sam. Now, in the garage, we examine another infamous serial killer, one that provided the press with his title when he told the San Francisco Examiner, Dear Editor, this is the Zodiac speaking. The Zodiac was laying claim to three unsolved homicides in the San Francisco Bay Area. He would go on to kill again. We have five confirmed murders in this series. Some say the number of those murdered by the Zodiac should be between 20 and 28. The Zodiac claims to have killed as many as 37 innocent victims. Still, to this day, this series of murders remains unsolved, and the one who called himself the Zodiac is yet to be identified. This is True Crime Garage. going to start off on a Friday in Vallejo, California. Vallejo is a waterfront city located in the San Francisco Bay Area of the state of California. This is where the Zodiac will find his first two victims or two of his earliest victims, because as we will later see, there is much debate on when and where the Zodiac started killing. On the night of Friday, December 20th, 1968, 16-year-old Betty Lou Jensen and 17-year-old David Arthur Faraday were out together on what most have reported to be their first date. Some reports state that the two dated briefly before the following incident. Both were very good students. In fact, later it was said that the two really had very little time for teenage romance as both were quite focused on their schooling and extracurricular activities. David Faraday was a top student and a member of the varsity wrestling team at Vallejo High School. He was an Eagle Scout as well and the recipient of the God and Country Award. Betty Lou Jensen was a top student at Hogan High School. The attack on the two teens on this Friday, December 20th, would leave both shot to death. The early reports state that the two went to a high school Christmas concert at Betty Lou Jensen's high school just several blocks away from Betty Lou's home. They were going to attend a party after, and at some point the two went for a drive and were met with gunfire. Later reports would indicate that maybe the two teens misled their parents. David Faraday borrowed his mother's 1961 Rambler station wagon and drove to Betty Lou Jensen's house, where he picked her up. The two left there about 8.30 p.m. Instead of going to the concert, the two went to a friend's house, where they hung out for about a half an hour. From there, they went to Mr. Ed's restaurant and drive-in, where they ordered a Coke and sat and chatted for a while. After the stop at Mr. Ed's restaurant and drive-in, the teens went for a drive, and they ended up at Lake Herman Road, which is an isolated country road known as a lover's lane. They parked in the lover's lane area just off of the winding dirt road. For reference, this is about 10 miles away from Betty Lou Jensen's house and school. The slain couple were found just before 11.30 p.m. that night by a passing motorist. 
This is Mrs. Manuel Borges, who was en route to the nearby town of Benicia, California. Benicia is considerably smaller than the city of Vallejo, and Lake Herman is basically between the two. Benicia is east of Vallejo. The vehicle was just outside the fence to the Lake Herman pumping station. Mrs. Manuel Borges lived off of Lake Herman Road, and as she is driving, she couldn't help but notice the vehicle parked. She saw the passenger door open. David was lying on his back, blood around him, and his feet were toward the rear wheels of the vehicle. Some reports have Betty Lou's body found as close as 10 feet from the rear of the vehicle. Others say as many as 30 feet away. Either way, it was obvious to the detectives that Betty Lou was in the process of running away from the scene when she was gunned down. There's an interview with the lead detective, and in it he says Betty Lou was 28 feet from the back of the car, so that's got to be right. Reports state that the girl had been shot five times in the upper right side of her back from a range of no more than 10 feet. Mrs. Borges was, of course, horrified at this discovery. She jumped back in her car and sped away. When she got to Benicia, she flagged down a police car. She told them what she had found, and the two Benicia officers raced to the scene. When they arrived, they found David Faraday still breathing. They called for police backup, detectives, and an ambulance. Betty Lou was dead at the scene. Faraday was rushed to the nearest hospital. Let's talk about what was found at the murder scene according to what was released at the time. Police will find the Rambler car hood still warm when they get to the scene. The ignition was on, and I'm guessing likely to run either the heater or the radio or both, because the two were planning on sitting there for a while. This is odd, though. The front passenger door was open. The other three doors and the tailgate to the vehicle were all closed and locked. So some have surmised that maybe the attacker was able to force both youths out the same door, the front passenger door. However, I found a report that states that there were footprints that detectives say indicate that Faraday got out of the driver's door and walked to the passenger side. And I have to wonder, could these be the killer's footprints and not David Faraday's? Right. Did he walk up to the driver's door, put the gun on Faraday, and force the two out the passenger door and walk around to greet them on the other side? David was shot in the head at close range. The bullet traveled forward from behind his left ear. Detectives found four bullet casings near the vehicle. The only thing they would say about the bullets at the time is that they came from a small caliber gun. One report specifically says small caliber rifle. One report says a 22 caliber, which of course is a small caliber. Investigators said the girl had not been molested and that robbery was not the motive. And even at close range, something with such a small shot as like a twenty two, it's going to take more than one shot to kill in most individuals. It will, however, if you do any research into hitmen and things of that nature, they often prefer to use a small caliber, specifically a twenty two, because they're doing headshots. Right. And I won't get into that too much but the bullet tends to bounce around inside quite a bit more than a larger caliber police even threw out some theories to the newspaper the day after and two days after the homicides and these theories include the following a deep heel print possibly from a boot was found in what they described as the brush grown area in the rear of a fencing this is running around the pump house right Detectives say that the brushy growth would be the only concealment offered to a sniper. So that's interesting because of several reasons. One, this is to suggest the possibility that the killer was there before the couple even arrived. In this theory, he would be lying in wait in the brush, hidden, and then when the two park, he emerges from that brushy growth area that they mentioned and takes control of of the would-be victims. Well, it makes a lot of sense because they would not see headlights. They wouldn't have time to react. If the perpetrator showed up in a vehicle, they would have 
at least some warning that he was coming. It's also interesting because I don't know exactly where this fencing and brushy growth area is in relationship to the victim's vehicle. And I say that this could be important because it could go against or for the next item. Because deputy said that there was a bullet hole in the rear window of the vehicle, leading them to theorize that Faraday stopped the car and was fired on from behind. Again, you'd have to think that the killer would have to know this area somewhat to even know that this lover's lane existed. Yes, and the thing here too, Captain, what I'm trying to point out about this sniper hiding in the bushes scenario. Right. From where the shots would have been fired at the two victims, the killer had to be standing beside the vehicle. So a stray shot hitting this rear window from that vantage point makes no sense. It didn't just happen. This was a shot that was likely intentionally fired into the back of the vehicle. Right. Meaning I think that the killer probably approached the two victims from the rear of the vehicle and then worked his way to the side where he eventually shot and killed both. You have this secluded area. Again, I think the killer would have to know the area. It's almost like they'd have to know the area so well that maybe they fired the shot not intentionally to kill somebody initially into the back window, but to get them to, like, scram. Flee the area in the vehicle or flee the vehicle? To flee the vehicle. So I lay in wait. The car comes in. They start talking. I creep behind them, I shoot the window, and by shooting the window, I have its game on, and now they're in full panic mode, and that's what I'm interested in as far as the the kill. The other theories are that the couple may have already been parked, and someone pulled in nearby and startled the two, or they were trailed and pulled over, or trailed to the spot, and then the killer returned to get them. Whatever happened, Captain... It happened relatively quickly and probably not too long before Mrs. Borges found them because the car hood was still warm and David Faraday was still alive. We do know that we have possible boot prints. And like you said, are those the male victim's footprints or those the killer's footprints? But it doesn't seem like we have tire marks from some other vehicle. That is true. There's no mention of tire marks from another vehicle. A Faraday died on arrival at the hospital at 12.05. And this is very unfortunate, not just because he passed, he's, he's now a murder victim, but for the investigation itself, because police at the time thought, okay, we have this attack these, on these two young teens. The female victim did not survive. We're rushing the male victim to the hospital. Hopefully we can save his life, but also we want to talk to this guy so he can tell us and give us details about this attack so we can find the perpetrator because Faraday passed away. This would not be possible for the detectives. Now the detectives were on the scene investigating by midnight that night. The Salano County Sheriff's office was the investigating agency. Now to fill out the timeline a little better, the teens left Betty Lou Jensen's place at eight 30. They went to a friend's house for about 30 minutes. Okay, so now 9 p.m. at the earliest. They leave and go get a Coke at Ed's. From there, they go driving. Again, about a 10-mile distance out to where the vehicle would later be found. Several witnesses spotted the vehicle at the park location off of Herman Lake Road. This is at 1015, 1035, and again at 11 p.m. This is based off of witness statements that David Faraday must have turned the vehicle around at some point after it was initially parked at that spot, which again makes you wonder and question the shot to the rear of the vehicle. Another witness said that they stopped their vehicle on the side of the road that night. This would be near the murder scene. Right. These two witnesses were young and they were on a date as well. They said that they stopped the vehicle to their vehicle to check something on the vehicle and while stopped they said that another vehicle slowed down and the driver was just kind of looking at them and then he went past the vehicle then stopped and then backed up toward them and this spooked the couple so they got into their vehicle and drove off they said that the vehicle then followed them for several minutes 
but eventually they lost this car. Well, first of all, I mean, I think we both, we disagree on a lot of things, but what we can probably agree on is this couple that possibly saw the killer that night, they didn't stop their car to check on a part. They're out at a lover's lane. They're probably out there to talk, flirt, a little necking, and then they see this creep come upon them, and he stares them down, and like you said, backs the vehicle up, starts to spook them. But I think I think that was the play. You know, stop the car, back it up, stop it again, act a little creepy to get them to start moving, and then you can follow them to see where they went. Yes, this is under the idea that maybe the Zodiac was just out there driving around, trolling, looking for potential victims. Now, they state that the vehicle, the the suspicious vehicle, they described it as a blue Plymouth Valiant, and they said that this incident took place around 9.30 p.m. Another witness said that they saw a white four-door Chevy Impala parked near David Faraday's car. Now, keep in mind, Faraday is driving his mother's Rambler. It's a station wagon, so... Faraday's car will be a little more noticeable than the other standard two-door sedans or four-door standards of sedans out there driving around. Do you know if it's if it was a Woody? I've I've looked up the vehicle. I I can't recall. No Woody on Lover's Lane. There are pictures of Faraday's vehicle online. It was later reported that ten shell casings were found. So let's examine this number a bit. I guess that number is fairly easy to get to when you really think about it because Betty Lou is stated to have been shot five times. David is shot at least once. So now we're at six casings. Right. And there was that shot that hit the back of the vehicle. So now we're at seven. Later, the Zodiac himself would say 10 shots were fired at the scene. John Douglas said that not only were bullet casings found near the vehicle, but also on the floorboards of the vehicle. Mm -hmm. So if this is correct, then this would indicate to me that the gun was fired inside the car at some point, or at least close enough to an open door or window that the casings fell inside the vehicle. We did have some early suspects in this case that were looked at one. There was a teen boy that was said to have had a thing for Betty Lou. And I don't know if the two had any type of relationship or if they ever dated But it seems that this teen went so far as to threaten David Faraday at some point. This teen was looked at and cleared. The other suspect would be an unknown individual. The Jensen family thought that maybe there was either a peeping Tom or someone spying on the family or Betty Lou in particular around the time of her murder. Right. Seven months later. The timeline of the next event in our murder series timeline, again, will start on a Friday and again will take place in and around Vallejo, California. This time, it's Friday, July 4th, Independence Day, 1969. 22-year-old Darlene Elizabeth Farron was a popular and sociable young woman. She was well-educated, a mother of one child, a daughter named Dina. Darlene was married to her second husband, Dean, and the three lived on Monterey Street. Both Dean and Darlene had a lot of friends. Now, Captain, out of all of the Zodiac victims, well, at least the confirmed five murders and two attempted murders, I would put Darlene at the top of the list when it comes to the highest probability that the killer and victim knew one another. This would be because of Darlene and Dean's sociable lifestyles and employment. They knew a lot of people. They had a lot of friends. Right. And they had a lot of people over to their house very often. So it could have been a friend of a friend. Hosting and attending parties, both small and large. Now, Darlene worked at a place called Terry's Restaurant. And one thing that is very curious, Darlene Farron told a co-worker that she knew the two victims, David and Betty Lou Jensen, or at least knew of them. Well, that makes some sense because Darlene attended Hogan High School years earlier. This is the same high school as Betty Lou Jensen. That night, Dean and Darlene were going to have friends over. 
Dean was at work. He was a cook at Caesar's restaurant. Darlene had a babysitter. She stopped by Dean's work to tell him that she and her younger sister were off to watch the parade boats. There, Dean asked if Darlene would pick up some fireworks on her way home. He and some friends wanted to set them off that night for the holiday. Right. Darlene and her sister then went to Darlene's work, again, Terry's restaurant. This is to tell some co-workers that her and Dean were hosting a party and they should come by after their shifts. The two went off to the boat parade and after they again went to Dean's work. By now it's getting late, but of course work shifts run late at restaurants on Friday nights. Darlene then went back to her work very briefly and then went home. Before letting the babysitter go for the night, she went out again. First, she took her little sister home and dropped her off. Right. And then she went and picked up her friend. This is 19-year-old Mike Majot. It sounds like Mike was expecting Darlene at some point that night, but regardless, Mike seemed to leave his house in a hurry, leaving without turning off the TV and the lights. The two were going to go purchase fireworks for the party later. That part is for sure. Yeah, but whether or not they plan on parking somewhere or not is up for debate. Darlene was driving her Chevy Corvair. Some sources say early in the drive, a car seemed to be following them. The car was light in color. The original idea was the two wanted to go get something to eat, but at some point, it changed to the two were going to look for a quiet place to talk. A neck. Mike says that this is why they were heading to the park. Right. Mike says they turned around at Mr. Ed's restaurant and drive in so they could change directions. They drove briefly and then they pulled into Blue Rock Springs Park. This was known as a good place to park. Now, if there was, in fact, a car... Following them in this version of the night's events, the car that was following them then pulled into the lot as well and then sped off. The report is either the same vehicle or one very close to the same description later returned and pulled in behind them. Right. The vehicle's lights shining on Darlene's car. Then not knowing what was going on, Mike was shot and the shooter just kept firing on him and Darlene. Darlene was shot a total of nine times. The shooter then walked back to his vehicle, and Mike says he got a good look at the guy. He described the assailant as a white guy, late 20s, 26 to 30 years old, with short, curly, light brown hair, stocky, about 5 foot 8 inches tall, and about 195 to 200 pounds, possibly more. The man was wearing a blue windbreaker and pleated pants. Mm. Unfortunately, Mike is in a terrible amount of pain and made some noise. Some reports say that he cried out. Yeah, and this could have tipped off to the killer that they were still alive. The shooter walked back to Darlene's vehicle and shot both Darlene and Mike two more times. After the shooter left, Mike opened the car's passenger door and fell out of the car, lying on the ground. The couple was found shortly after midnight by three young people who called the police. Police received a call about the shooting at 10 after midnight, and quickly officers and a detective arrived on the scene. The police report says police arrived at 12.38 a.m. There, they found Darlene barely alive, slumped over the steering wheel, and Mike in really bad shape, lying outside of the car. Yeah, I think with the Zodiac, what was always missing in in my brain is why but as you're pointing out we have a couple that does not become a victim but possibly sees the zodiac and the zodiac's kind of toying with them maybe testing the waters a little bit and then here if these reports are correct he pulls up next to a car that like we said they're sitting there talking maybe making out and this guy pulls up seeming to be a solo driver. What are you, some perv that's going to watch? And then he backs away and then comes back and parks right behind them. It's almost like he wants to induce some kind of panic. He wants to induce the reaction first. And then it's game on. And so do you think, in your humble goat opinion, 
is is this because he wants to see them in fear or 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 what well one thing we will learn about this killer is that he enjoys watching the reactions of the masses so why wouldn't he enjoy seeing the terrified reaction of those that he is hunting or attacking yeah The question I have about the two younger people that say that they saw a suspicious vehicle and provided a description of such, I wanted to find a description of the vehicle they were driving. Again, that goes back to the idea of David Faraday's vehicle, the Rambler, is a station wagon, would look considerably different than most of the other vehicles just out on the street that night. Right. If they were driving a station wagon as well... Well, that tells me a different story, that maybe the Zodiac was actually targeting Faraday's car or the the two people in the vehicle. So that was one thing that I looked for. And again, yes, why will be a huge question when it comes to the Zodiac? Because for the five murdered victims, it's very, very likely that he did not know any of them. Of course, we see that often with these serial killers, but... This is a unique situation, unlike any of the others that we've talked about so far. Now, again, we have at the second murder scene, we have the police on scene at 1238 a.m. At that time, the buses were en route. That's cops speak for ambulance on the way. Right. The cops pulled Darlene from the vehicle. Remember, she slumped over the steering wheel. The cops all believed that she was trying to tell them something. And specifically, they said that she was either saying I or me or something of that nature, but they couldn't make it out, and they never really got any words from her. But this is something where I go back to the idea of because of her lifestyle and her husband's lifestyle and where they worked, I put her probability of victim and killer knowing each other significantly higher than a lot of the other victims. And you have to wonder when they're pulling her from the vehicle, did she believe she knew who attacked them and was trying to tell the officers that when they were trying to save her life? Cheers, mates. Cheers to you, Colonel. Cheers to you, Captain. Cheers to all of the people out there in listener land. And all the people in the back. We have victims Michael Majot and Darlene Farron. They were rushed to Kaiser Hospital. Darlene was DOA, and Mike was rushed into surgery. And two days later, reported to be in, quote, satisfactory condition. Mike Majot survived the attack despite being shot in the face, neck, and chest. The newspapers at the time reported that each victim was shot three times, so it looks like this would be one piece of holdback information. The number of shots fired, because we already said Darlene, we would later learn, was shot a total of nine times. Do you think that the killer is leaving them on the brink of life, or do you think they just don't know? Well, I think that the killer was successful in his first attack, killing Mm -hmm. both of the victims at the scene. And I think that he absolutely thought that he was successful again at the second attack, having killed both victims. And we now know that Mike Majot survived. And we'll get into that, why there's evidence that the killer believed that both were dead. Back to the number of shots. We know that Darlene was shot nine times, and it does look like Mike was likely shot three times. The newspaper said seven nine millimeter cartridges were found near the car. The car's windows were open. The ignition was on and the car was in gear. It appears that the vehicle stalled out. The radio was on. Now, because Mike survived, he was able to tell the police quite a bit about the incident. Right. Per John Douglas, the gun used was thought to be a Browning high-power semi-automatic handgun. 
Police put this together because of Mike's description of the attack and that the shooter did not seem to stop to reload the gun at any point. So this compared with the 9mm casings and the total number of shots, of course, known to police at the time, indicated what type of gun was used. This is because similar guns, you would have to stop and reload to get off that number of shots. Yeah. Hold on, I'm reloading. I'm not saying that they're incorrect. They very likely are correct. But one thing I want to point out is in Mike's description of the events, the killer shot both he and Darlene and then returned to his vehicle. Right. And at which time Mike cried out. And Mike, it's very interesting because Mike says he does not know why he he cried out. If, if he was reacting to something or if he was just in a terrible amount of pain. Right. But then the killer returns, shoots Darlene twice, and then shoots Mike twice, almost to make sure, like, okay, I'm going to make sure both of them are dead, or if I didn't finish one or both of them off, I now have. I question if there was an opportunity when the killer went back to their vehicle, if, in fact, the killer went back to the vehicle for the purpose of reloading. Do cockroaches want to play? Keep in mind, Mike's been shot. He's in a good deal of pain. Right. There are some things, some details of that event that he could be misremembering. Well, and it's possible he's also going in and out of consciousness. Well, and we also know that Mike Majot would tell more than one version of the story to police when they were investigating this homicide. Yeah, but I, I also think some of that is that you're trying so hard to remember. Uh, and, and and the more they question you or more, look, you're probably not just getting questioned by police. You're being questioned by your friends also. Hey, what do you remember, man? If, and then how many people told him, man, if you could just remember something more, maybe we could catch the guy. That'd be very frustrating. The location of the murder scene is only about two miles away from the Lake Herman Road murders. So given the short time frame of just seven months and two miles apart and the similarities to the crimes, it would not have taken long for the police to suspect that the two were connected. But they would not have to figure this out for themselves because at 1240 a.m., a man phoned the Vallejo Police Department to report and claim responsibility for the attack. The killer also took credit for the murders of Jensen and Faraday six and a half months earlier. Here are the details of that call. Vallejo Police Dispatcher 26-year-old Nancy Slover took the call. Nancy Slover described the male caller's voice and tone as though he was mocking and taunting her for shock value. Mm. And if, in fact, he was, she said it worked. The caller spoke the following words in a monotone, rehearsed fashion. I want to report a double murder. If you will go one mile east on Columbus Parkway to the public park, you will find the kids in a brown car. Right. They were shot with a 9mm Luger. I also killed those kids last year. Goodbye. Yeah, now, a couple things. I mean, first of all, he he calls them kids. So, I'm not saying that we should assume, but you can start off by going, well, he's probably older than the victims. He's definitely older in my opinion. And by this time, of course he's read all of the details about his first crimes about the first two murders. And he knows whether he knew Faraday and Jensen before shooting them. He definitely knew who they were after he killed them because their names and ages where they went to school, their parents' names and addresses were all found in the local papers. For those of you who have seen the David Fincher film Zodiac, that is the creepy phone call at the six minute mark of the movie. Yeah. Where the killer reports a double murder. That's again why I think he thought he finished them both off. His words, before anything gets on the news or anything gets in the paper for him to learn that someone survived, he's calling and not reporting a murder He's or an attack. He's reporting specifically a double murder. Right. But back to the movie, The Zodiac. If anybody has not seen the movie Zodiac, it's one of the best true crime dramas. It's incredibly good, and it was considered to be a box office failure, which does not make a whole lot of sense to me 
I love the movie. I've seen it half a dozen times. Anyway, this phone call from the Zodiac, we need to point out this was not, this call was not recorded. Repeat, not a recorded call. It's been widely reported that the call was recorded, but listen to the goat. It was not. And we know this simply because the police dispatcher says they did not have the equipment at their disposal to record incoming calls at that time. So right. it's not that they didn't record. They failed to record just this call. They just didn't record any of them because they didn't have the capability. So that is very important for several reasons. The first being that Nancy, the dispatcher, would have to recall the caller's message after the caller hung up. So it's not verbatim, which I believe to be important. As some have pointed out, the directions provided by the Zodiac were actually incorrect. This would likely mean that the Zodiac did not know the area well. Right. However, you have to keep in mind that the killer caller would not want to give directions from the payphone where he's calling from duh he's going to give them directions from the police department to get the police to where the kids are located do you understand what i'm saying yeah i've i've spoke english my whole life okay two things that i believe are fully correct with nancy's report of what the caller said are double murder meaning Zodiac intended to and had every reason to believe that he successfully carried out his mission of killing both victims. And I say that I believe that she's recalling this correctly because she says that she was shocked by his tone, number one, but she's going to be shocked by his words as well. Double murder. Double murder is something that you do not forget when you receive a very short, quick phone call. Want a burger? Get a burger. Want a free fry? Get a free fry. Well, he seems very uh, smug. Yes. The other part, the second part, which I believe to be 100% correct, and I find this to be super interesting, at least to me, the fact that the Zodiac says to her, if you go one mile east on Columbus Parkway to the public park, you will find the kids in a brown car. Regardless if people believe that the directions are correct or incorrect, again, I made an argument that you wouldn't give directions from your location that you're calling from. You would give directions from the police department to where the kids are. But let's scrap that entirely. Right. Why the hell is the Zodiac giving directions to what he calls the public park? Why wouldn't he just name the park? Right, if you, knew you would the area. find the kids at so and so park in a brown car. Yeah, if he knew the area, he'd know the name of the park. If he doesn't know the name of the area, it's just oh, some park. Right. He says public park and offers directions to the public park. Well, we have already said it once Blue Rock Springs Park. The park has a name, Blue Rock Springs Park. He wants them to find the kids. We know that. He why else call the police unless you want them to find them? So he wants them to find the kids and he wants it to be known that he did both of these shootings, the double homicide the year before at Christmas and this one uh, on this night. Right. So if he knew the name of the park, why wouldn't he just say the name of the park to make sure that the police got to the right place? And again, if you say the name of the park, you don't need to give any directions at all. The call should have been, I want to report a double murder. You will find the kids in a brown car at Blue Rock Springs Park. They were shot with a 9mm Luger. I also killed those kids last year. Goodbye. Goodbye. Also, the location of the phone call is strange. Police traced the call to a phone booth at a gas station at Springs Road in Tuolum. This is located about three-tenths of a mile from Darlene Farron's home and only a few blocks from the Vallejo Police Department. Mm -hmm. I don't think this location is weird because of the distance to the victim's home or the police station. Right. It's weird because of the distance from Blue Rock Springs Park, the public park where he shot them. And it seems he may not have known the name of the park. So based off of eyewitnesses and ear witnesses for that fact, the latest that Darlene and Mike could have been shot would have been maybe 12, 10 a.m. Most believe that it was more likely between 12.02 and 12.04 a.m. Uh -huh. Why is this important? Well, we know that the call 
from the killer came in at 1240 a.m. So depending on how you shake it out, there is approximately 30 to 38 minutes after the attack before the phone call. The fastest routes from the murder scene to the phone booth is seven and a half minutes, nine minutes, and 11 minutes. Right. Three different routes, the three fastest routes. So what took him so long to get from murder scene to the phone booth where he called it in? So you're saying there's about 20 to 30 minutes of missing time, but that doesn't mean he necessarily was traveling. He could have already got to the phone booth and decided, well, I don't know what to say yet. What am I going to say? I'm going to, I, I have to prepare this. Even though his conversation was pretty simple, it was pretty direct, it was pretty kind of demeaning, uh, smug, like I said before, but maybe he just sat there. Well, my first thought was maybe he just hung out around the murder scene to watch what was going on. We already speculated that maybe this killer enjoys seeing the reaction of his actions. So maybe he hung out there until he started hearing the police sirens and then took off and then made the call. But the problem with that is this drive, the fastest route would be seven to maybe 11 minutes distance. The cops were on the scene at 1238. The call came in at 1240. So the sirens aren't what scared him from the scene. He very likely left shortly after shooting the victims and we have this based off of eyewitness and ear witness statements. So if he left immediately afterward, why do we have that, that difference in time? And it, it could be something as silly as he just drove around for a while or didn't know what payphone he wanted to use. There's also th the chance that he's not from the area and that's why he doesn't know the name of the park. And he also doesn't know where a phone booth is right. to make this call. He went and had to go looking for a phone booth. One piece of speculation that I thought was very interesting was somebody pointed out the high probability that the killer would have got victims blood on their clothing or person. Mm -hmm. And that this phone booth is in a highly residential area. Meaning if the killer didn't want anybody living witnesses to see his vehicle, Right. Maybe it's as simple as he drove home, parked his car, changed his clothes so he wouldn't be covered in blood, and walked to a payphone or then drove across town to another payphone. That makes up for the lapse in time. I actually think it's something a little more sadistic. I think it's something a little more sick. Driving around, flicking it the whole time. I think, and we know how these killers operate they love to return to the scene of the crime they love to pull the purple headed yogurt slinger the lake herman road murders that took place six and a half months earlier mm. is only two miles distance from the most recent attack right i think there's a good chance that maybe he shot these two victims and then drove to the old murder scene Maybe even to reenact it or live it out or, or just kind of look at the area, right. admiring his work. Because if you map out a route from murder scene to murder scene and then to the payphone, well, you're left with a whole lot less of uh, unaccounted for time. Right. But I also wonder, you said this uh, payphone was pretty close to the police department? Correct. I wonder if there's, again, like we know that he wants to kind of induce panic. He wants to see this fear in their eyes. I wonder, uh, he likes to see the reaction. I wonder if he wanted to see if anybody called the, the police and to see if the police were already reacting to it. That's a possibility. Like, I'm going to drive by the police department and see if people are in, in route yet. So let's go through Mike Majot's statements of what he says happened that night because we now have a surviving victim a, a living witness he says now remember he said at some point that they might have been followed early but and that's what led them to parking at the blue rock springs park in that version of the story he says that it was a light colored car that was following them and this is very interesting 
And remember, we had mention of a white American car in the first attack on Lake Herman Road. So a white American car, again, making an appearance in this version of the story. Right. There was also a situation where Darlene's sister, Christina, said that Darlene, our newest victim, had a heated conversation with a man in a white car in the parking lot of Terry's restaurant on one of their trips to the restaurant that night. Remember, they went to the restaurant a couple times. She says on one of those occasions, she witnessed her sister arguing with a, a man she did not know his name, and this man was in a white vehicle. Mm -hmm. But then when you dive in and take a look at the statement Mike gave to police from his hospital bed, in this version of the story, he says nothing about being followed. In fact, he says they pulled into the lot to talk, and shortly after, a few other cars pulled in. These were all believed to be other teens. Mike says a car pulled in and just kind of sat running and watching them for maybe a minute or two. Then the car sped off. The car then came back and pulled up behind them the way that a cop car would. Mike says that though through a very brief conversation, the two of them, both he and Darlene, believed that the person now parked behind them was in fact a police officer. He says that the man got out with a high-powered flashlight yeah. like one used by police. He says he couldn't see the man because he was shining the light directly at them. This is the old light blind technique that police will use. Then the man just started firing. Mike's hospital account also includes Mike saying the gunfire was not loud, that maybe the gunman used some type of silencer. So are you suggesting that Mike is saying that it's possible it was a cop and possibly some altered weapon so it would you know, like I said, like a maybe like a man-made silencer on the gun. He's saying the the manner that the vehicle pulled up behind them would would be the way that a cop would typically stop someone. The way that he felt that the the person approached the vehicle, the energy, yeah. That he he and Darlene didn't think that they were in any danger because they thought that it was a cop walking up to inquire as to why they were just sitting there. But then you think. As far as the killer goes, background, security guard, maybe was a patrol officer at some point, maybe had some military background. Correct. And we we should be perfectly clear here. He's not saying that it was a police car. Right. Because we have the description of the vehicle that he says that the gunman was driving that night. Mike Majot's description of that vehicle, he says that it looked a lot like Darlene's car. Maybe even the same model. So this would mean it would be a Chevy Corvair. And then some have pointed out that back then the Ford Mustang looked a lot like a Chevy Corvair. So the police have always kind of said, we believe that it was either a Chevy Corvair or a Ford Mustang. Mike Majot says that the vehicle's color was about the same color as Darlene's car. So brown, but he also says maybe a little lighter. So I guess a light brown. One interesting thing, though. Tan, ban the tan sedan. Mike said that he saw California license plates on the vehicle. He couldn't make out any of the numbers after he had been shot, but he says he specifically remembers that it was, in fact, California license plates. Right. This second version of his story is probably more correct, and I say that for several reasons, but one, mainly because this version is, of the story is backed up by Darlene's sister. But hold on a second. You're not saying, because we have multiple people giving. We very likely just have Mike Majot giving different versions of. The no, but what events. I'm saying, this is not the only person to give the police information so far. Correct. But, but we're not saying that any of these victims in any way, do we think they're lying to the police? We're just saying because of the chaotic situation that they were in and just heck just surviving is something. There has been some belief over the years that maybe Mike Majot has purposely left out some details really out of fear. Okay. Is, is one general thought. The other thought is that he may have altered some of the versions of that story and told different stories because he was, in fact, in love with Darlene and didn't want to 
shame her after right. she'd fallen victim. So th- that's why the story goes from we were being followed and the car followed us into that parking spot to then later we went and parked so we could have somewhere to talk. The general thought is, and Mike has never confirmed this, so we don't know. The thought has been, well, maybe Mike made up a reason why the two would be parked there other than they just wanted to go and park there, if you know what I mean. Well, yeah. (laughs) The other thing, though, too, is keep in mind, this is a 19-year-old boy who's been shot three times and was probably traumatized in all kinds of, I mean, you couldn't even imagine. Yeah, most definitely. But again, it's just like that, that one of the first couples that think they saw the killer and then the killer possibly followed them for a while. And they're like, well, we were just stopped on the side of the road because something broke in the car. It's like, no, you, you probably were making out. You just didn't want to tell your parents. I mean, we have to remember this is 1968 right 69 and darlene was married 69 (laughs) well and keep in mind this version that we just went through he says that when they pulled into the parking area of the park that there were already some other vehicles there they had reasons to believe that they were you know younger people just kind of hanging out and that those vehicles left and then the suspect's vehicle pulled up just kind of sat there looking at him for a little bit, drove off, and then came back. And the reason why I think that this second version is the more likely is a statement based from Darlene's sister's account of the night's events. Mm -hmm. She says, this is Pam Huckabee, Darlene's younger sister, says she has... Hold on on a second. We have Betty Lou Jensen, Huckabee. These are like the most 1960s names of all time names that you'd think you would hear on like a 60s sitcom or something so pam huckabee says that she always believed that she missed witnessing the attack just by seconds she says quote i was there in the parking lot just leaving when the car drove up behind her i relive it every fourth of july weekend i wonder what i might have done differently the quote police car passed me going in as we were going out We heard the pop pop, but thought it was fireworks again. So that we're clear, she's not saying she saw a police car, right? She's calling it that because Mike Majo said that it behaved in the way that he believed a cop would pull them over or approach their vehicle in the July 5th, 1969 Vallejo times Herald. It read officers at the scene broadcast an alert for a young heavyset white male adult riding in a brown automobile in the July 6th, 1969 Vallejo times Herald. It read under the subheading Brown car. So it's obvious that police are looking for the man described to them by Mike Majot, as well as this Brown automobile. I I'm pointing this out because we have this question mark of a white American car, but to be perfectly clear in the story that makes the most sense from Mike Majot there is no white American car. It's a brown or light brown vehicle. If it's brown or light brown, flush it down. But let's not look past the obvious, right? Mm-hmm. We have a married woman hanging out with, I guess you could almost assume they're, they're at least flirtatious. I, mean, I don't know if you would call, call him her boyfriend, but she's married. So number one suspect is always the husband did it. Yes, this is a unique situation. So Mike Majot and Darlene Farron were described by everyone, including Darlene's husband, as good, good friends. Right. And so these were not people that were just hanging out for the first time together. In fact, Darlene's husband said that Darlene had a lot of male friends, and this did not bother him. A lot of that was based off of where they work. They both worked at restaurants and anybody that's worked at restaurants will know that often people after their shifts, they, they tend to go out together, whether it be in a large group or a small group. And so of course her husband, Dean was looked at regardless of how he felt about her hanging out with Mike or other men. Right. He was looked at quite well. The issue being that he was at work. He was still on his work shift at the time of the murder. So he has not only just 
a good alibi. It's a it's a solid alibi. So Dean Farron has been cleared, as well as two other individuals that were male friends of Darlene Farron. They were cleared as well. So when we look back on this case, in the case before Captain, we do have suspects that were looked at that were not the quote unquote Zodiac. Right. Well, that knew the victims and were in fact cleared by the local authorities in those investigations. And but you have to think for law enforcement, once you roll out those stereotypical suspects or suspects that you think are connected directly to the victims, now you have to step back and look at the whole picture and go, Well, maybe we have a serial killer on our hands. Do you think there's any possible way that this killer is using like a, a rental system or maybe even borrowing the cars from different individuals? I think the borrowing of vehicles is quite possible, uh, especially given the profile put forward by some people over the years. Um, one profile states that the they would believe that the Zodiac may have lived with a parent or parents for a considerable amount of their adult life. And we know from other serial cases that we have covered, mm-hmm. and I'm referencing the one I, that comes immediately to mind is the Atlanta child killer case where they were getting different descriptions of vehicles from connected victims because sometimes he was driving his car. Other times he was driving his parents' vehicle. And we've seen that in other cases as well, where they will borrow someone's vehicle because they know they're going to go out and commit the murders with it or flee the scene with it. And if they're seen, they don't want to be seen in the vehicle that could be traced back to them. Right. So what do we know about this killer? We both said that we think he likes to see the reaction of the victims before he shoots them. We know that he possibly has means to have or access to multiple vehicles. We know he likes to toy with other individuals and we, for him to follow around multiple eyewitnesses, there's probably other eyewitnesses that just never came forward because they didn't think much of it. He's trying to put himself in the right place at the right time so you can have an opportunity. The things that I would add to my thoughts about our killer is even though these two attacks took place relatively close to one another, a two mile distance from each other, I don't necessarily think that the killer has to be local. Again, I question why wouldn't he just say the name of the park rather than provide directions. The other thing that I suspect is going on here too, is that the need to have a female victim. Yeah. Because in both situations, we see similar MO. Now, of course, we're, we have to piece some of this together ourselves because nobody survived the first attack to tell us what went down. But we can, base off of the evidence and off of the, the statements from the second attack, it appears that what he was looking to do is to stop the, immediately stop the threat of the male fighting back right and then we see overkill on the female where the female is shot more times than the male and so i think there is a need for him to have a female present to kill a female and i think that that kind of sexual gratification well and i think that that's the purpose of him pulling up stopping and looking at the people and then deciding if he's going to attack or not. But maybe he needs the male victim just as much as he needs the female victim. Because it's almost like he's like, I think uh, deep down in my soul or whatever, I'm not good enough for you. But I'm going to be better than this individual at this moment by killing them. And then, and then, but you're going to pay because you didn't choose me. I've had some people, I've heard some people say, well, he was probably making sure that the victims were young, that he was looking for a certain age group. And I... I think that is the silliest statement I've ever heard because one would not think to find a bunch of old people parked in these lovers' lanes. Right. Right? He's not he yes, he is looking for young victims. That's why he's choosing to attack in this manner. He expects to find younger people parked there together. I think it's the sometimes you just have a couple guys hanging out 
drinking or you have just teenagers that have nowhere to go that park a car somewhere. I think it's important to him that there be a female victim. And as you pointed out, likely a male victim as well. What we do know for sure, Captain, is that this killer wants everyone to know he Uh is responsible for both of these attacks. He wants them to know that these attacks are connected and he is, in fact, a serial killer. He's a killer that's brutal, methodical, and he's thinking out these crimes. He's also thinking out the communications that he chooses to pass on to police. And we will also learn that this guy will not stop and therefore we will have more crime scenes and victims to analyze. We've said it before and we'll say it again. All of True Crime Garage episodes are available everywhere. Apple Podcasts, Stitcher, Spotify, and check out our bonus show called Off the Record. That's on Stitcher Premium. Thanks for listening. Thanks for telling a friend. Make sure you join us back here in the garage tomorrow. Until then, be good, be kind, and don't let it.